Hi everyone, today we're going to be solving AQA, GCAC Biology, Higher Tier Paper, 1H. In this particular video, we are solving June 2022. This question is about cells and transport. We need to complete table 1, name the cell part and the function of the cell part. Contains genetic information. So we know genetic information is contained within the nucleus. Mitochondria. Mitochondria, the function of the cell, a cell part is basically it is it provides the site of aerobic respiration. Controls the movement of substances into and out of the cells. Cell surface membrane controls the movement of substances of substances into and out of the cells. So we can write cell membrane. Cells in potatoes are plant cells. Cells in potatoes do not contain chloroplast. What is the function of the chloroplast? Now we know that chloroplast contains chlorophyll and the main function is to do photosynthesis. Name one type of cell in potato plant that does not contain chloroplast. We can name xylem, we can name phloem that does not contain chloroplast. Also we can name uh, you know, cells like root hair cells. A student investigated the effect of salt concentration on pieces of potato. This is the method that the student uses. Cut three pieces of potato of the same size. Record the mass of each potato piece. Add 150 cm cube of 0.4 mole per dm cube salt solution to a beaker. Place each potato piece into the beaker. After 30 minutes, remove each potato piece and dry the surface with a paper towel. Record the mass of each potato piece. Repeat steps 1 to 6 using different concentration of salt solution. What is the independent variable in this investigation? Obviously, the independent variable is the concentration of the salt solution. Because in a different exp experiment, the student is using different concentration of salt solution and repeating the experiment. The mass of the potato pieces. Well, the mass of the potato pieces, they are changed. However, you know, it is minimized to keep it as much as constant time potato is left in salt solution is constant for every every experiment and volume of the salt solution is also kept constant for every experiment so these are control variable why did the student dry the surface of each potato piece with a paper towel in step 5 so basically the student is trying to remove the excess salt solution or the water so the student all right will write the answer in this way to make sure only the potato mass was measured the student calculated the percentage change in mass of each potato piece for one potato piece the starting mass was 2.5 gram the end mass was 2.7 gram calculate the percentage increase in mass of the potato piece percentage increase in mass is equals to increase in mass divided by the starting mass into 100 so first of all we are going to do increase in mass which is 2.7 minus 2.5 divided by the starting mass which is 2.5 times 100 this gives us 0 0.2 divided by 2.5 times 100 or 8 percent the student used the results from each potato piece to calculate the average percentage change in mass of each concentration so we can see the concentration of the salt solution in mole per dm cube from 0 to 0 0.4 is used and percentage in change in mass is from 9.8 then it decreases goes to 0 and then go goes below 0 so it decreases in mass after that complete figure 1 we should label the x axis use a suitable scale for the x axis and plot the data from table 2 and after that we are going to draw a line of best fit so first of all labeling the x axis x axis is always the you know uh, independent variable so we, in this case x axis will be the concentration of salt solution in mole per dm cube so it starts from 0 so we can refer to this one as 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.3 and 0.4 now in terms of tabulating the data we have to read from this particular table so for 0.0 .0 the pers mean percentage is you know is like positive so it's 9.8 for 0 0.1 it's 9.5 for 0 0.2 it's 7.0 0 0.3 it's 0 0.4 for 0 0.4 it's negative 1.4 now we will have to draw a line of best fit so this line of best fit needs to be a smooth line of best fit so we will try to make it as much smooth as possible
What concentration of salt solution was equal to the concentration of the solution inside the potato piece? This can be found where the, li where the uh, line crosses the x-axis. So we can see the line crosses the x-axis at the point 0 0.31 mole per dm cube. Because the value will be taken from our graph, so as long as we do the graph correctly, we will get the answer correct. Explain why the potato pieces in 0.4 mole per dm cube salt solution decreased in mass. So our explanation explanation is very simple, and guys, this particular question is very very common. So what do we write in a situation where we have a potato piece or any general plant pieces which is in a higher concentration of salt solution? We will say water moves out of the potato cells. And how does it move out? It moves out by the process of osmosis. Because movement of water generally from through a partially permeable membrane is osmosis. And then we have to give the reason because the solution in the the solution in the potato cells is less concentrated than outside. Or we can say the solution in the potato is more dilute than outside solution. Plant cells and fungal cells are similar in structure. Figure 2 shows a fungal cell. Name one structure in figure 2 which is present in both plant cells and fungal cells but not in animal cells. So in plant cells and fungal cells both have cell wall. The other alternative answer will be permanent vacuole. Which disease is caused by a fungus? Now, gonorrhea is a bacterial disease. Malaria is caused by protist. Measles is caused by virus. So, rose black spot is a fungal disease. Guys, from here, you can actually memorize the information about the rose black spot because in our syllabus for AQA biology, GCAC biology, rose black spot is indicative as a fungal disease and it's a very common question that is asked every time. A fungal cell divides every once every 90 minutes. How many times would this fungal cell divide within 24 hours? So first of all, we need to make sure in 24 hours how many minutes we have. So we'll multiply it with 60, then we will divide the whole answer by 90. So that gives us 16. So it will divide 16 times. Some types of fungal cell are grown to produce high protein food. The high protein food can be used to make meat free burgers. Where is protein digested in the human digestive system? Protein is generally digested in the stomach and the small intestine. Salivary gland is actually there only to produce saliva which contains carbohydrate enzyme uh, like uh, carbohydrate enzyme amylase and liver produces bile. Large intestine is mainly for the absorption of water and some vitamins. So stomach is the only place where proteins are digested among the four listed items here. Which chemical could be used to test if burgers contain protein? Proteins are generally tested with biorate reagent. Benedict's reagent test for reducing sugar. Ethanol is used for test for uh, you know, lipids and iodine solution is used for test for starch. Table 3 shows some information about the burgers made from meat and meat-free burgers. We can see burgers that are made from meat contains higher protein. In terms of fiber, meat-free burgers have higher fiber. In terms of fat, burgers made from meat have a higher, higher fat content. Carbohydrate both have similar quantity and cholesterol burgers made with meat have very high cholesterol which is 120 milligram and uh, meat free burgers do not have any cholesterol. Evaluate the use of burgers made from meat compared with meat free burgers in providing humans with a healthy balanced diet. Now this question consists of six marks and we need to use table three information in our knowledge uh, and our own knowledge that means this particular question will have a level two or level three marking so the level 3 marking will give us six marks which should represent a judgment which is strongly linked and logically supported by a sufficient range of correct reasons that we will provide so first of all uh, you know let's let's have because this particular question is very common so let's see what is the uh, very what is the indicative points that we can write all right in order to uh, give uh, you know explanation about this particular comparison about the meat-free burger and uh, you know a general use of burger the meat and meat-free burgers first of all we already talked about these particular points in here meat-free burgers are high in fiber contains the same amount of in fiber low fat content all right 
contains the same amount of carbohydrate and zero cholesterol. So what can we say due to this reasoning? We can say meat-free burgers contains more fiber which aids digestion and prevents constipation. Whereas meat burgers contains more protein, it contains high amount of protein which is needed for growth. It contains high in fat, that means it can provide more energy. However, it is a problem that can cause coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease or may lead to obesity because of the high energy content. Meat burgers can contain contain more cholesterol that can cause narrowing of the arteries or you know can cause heart attack which may lead to the need for stent or you know taking statins or lowering blood pressure. Both burgers have similar amount of carbohydrate which is good for providing energy. Now guys from these particular points we can actually only receive four marks. We still need to write our own ideas to achieve the full six marks. So just remember that from here only four points will be applicable for your final answer. And for our writing our own points, we need to write meat burgers require animals to be farmed, which can increase methane in atmosphere and contributes to global warming. Other points that we can write, they are meat burgers require animals to be slaughtered, which may have ethical issues. Some people won't eat meat-free burgers because some people don't like the idea of eating fungus and we can also write because some people rather prefer the taste of meat. So guys we can achieve another two marks from this particular part as well. So you know this particular question is not mainly based on the points that you write. Also you know basis from the point that you derive from the table. You need to derive at least two points from the table all right and then give a reasoning for that and then derive two points from your own and give a reasoning for that. So you will be writing total of eight points however it will ensure that you will get six marks. A student prepared some onion cells. The student viewed the onion cells using light microscope and this is the method used by the student. Cut a onion into pieces using a sharp knife. Peel off a thin layer of onion epidermis from one piece of the onion. Place the onion epidermis into microscope slide in a single flat layer. Then three drops of iodine solution is added. So the iodine solution is used like a stain. Slowly lower a cover slip at an angle into the onion epidermis. Place the slide on the stage of the microscope to view it. Table 4 shows a risk assessment for this experiment. Iodine solution is a irritant. irritant. It may cause allergic reaction or skin rash. Plan to minimize the risk. To minimize the risk for exposure, all right, we can wash the skin immediately after contact or wear gloves. I believe wearing gloves would be the better answer. So. I am not going to opt out for other options. Then sharp knife. The risk associated with the sharp knife is you know you can cut your skin and the planning to minimize the risk would be to cut the onion away from the body or to keep the fingers away from the blade when cutting or cut on a chopping board. So I believe the best answer would be cut away from the body and you know make sure that you are not cutting while someone is around then you would not you would not accidentally cut their cut their body cut their skin. Give a reason for each of the following steps in the method. A thin layer of onion epidermis is used. So the thin layer will help the student to see individual cells. Iodine solution is added to the onion epidermis. Iodine solution is acting like a stain. So the answer will be to stain parts of the cell. A cover slip is lowered in onto the onion epidermis at an angle. So you know it is done at an angle to prevent air bubbles. Figure 3 shows that the student saw under microscope at a magnification of 400x. We can see the student saw the cell wall, the student saw the nucleus very clearly. The length of cell Z in figure 3 is 4.8 cm. Calculate the real length of cell Z, give your answer to in micrometers. So since the answer is you know it's demanded in micrometer micrometers first of all we need to think of the you know um, the formula for magnification so magnification we know that it is equals to size of the image divided by the size of the real object then we need to change rearrange so that we can because we are trying to find out the real length of cell z and we know the magnification and we know the image size so we're going to change the subject so size of image size of real object will be equal to size of image divided by magnification now we can do it by di dividing 4.8 by 4, 400 
once we do that our answer is 0.012 centimeter because we need the answer in micrometer so we will multiply 0.012 centimeter with 10 to convert it into millimeter then we will multiply it with 1000 to convert it into micrometer so our answer is 120 micrometer Figure 4 shows the student's drawing of figure 3. We can see there is a lot of mistakes. There is, you know, uh, the cells are not complete. And uh, they are shown, you know, uh, even the cells, they are not, you know, most of them are didn't close, all right? And the nucleus are shown in a wrong position. Give two ways the student could improve the drawing in figure 4. There can be many ways this, this particular diagram can be improved. One of the ways is that the student can use continuous line to ensure no gaps in lines the student must not shade the student must not you know put gaps between the cells and the student should draw the nucleus in the uh, correct location and the student can also you know label some cell parts in the diagram so you know i'm just gonna give you two extra points and uh, two uh, original points all right so you can just choose from them which one is best for you that you want to write Onion cells can be seen using an electron microscope. Give two ways onion cells would look different when seen using an electron microscope. So when we will view any cells under electron microscope, we are going to get it more magnified and we will get more detail and which means higher resolution. This number one point must be written, whereas number two, we can do the either or. Plants and animals have many defense responses. Table 5 shows some plant defenses. Identify whether each is a chemical or a physical response. So having a thick waxy layer on the surface. So the thick waxy layer is like a physical barrier. So it's a physical response. Berries that are poisonous. This is definitely a chemical. Bark on a tree that falls off. This is definitely physical because any any idea that gives us physical idea of you know physically preventing an animal from damaging it will be physical and any idea that gives us that it is a chemical that is deterring the animal any animal from eating it will be chemical. Mimicry is a mechanical adaptation seen in both plants and animals. Figure 5 shows two insect, a hornet which is a deadly insect because its sting is very painful and a hornet moth which mimics the hornet however is not a deadly insect hornets are insects that sting other animals and cause pain hornet moths do not sting other animals such as how mimicry helps the hornet moth survive since the hornet moth looks like the hornet so predators or generally animals that eats the you know hornet moth are, are deceived by the coloring and they avoid eating it Adult hornet moths lay eggs that hatch into larvae. Figure 6 shows the larvae of a hornet moth. The larvae of the hornet moth lives inside the root of trees. Use the tree roots as a source of food, cause damage to the tree roots. Explain why a tree might die if the roots of the tree are damaged. So this is a 6 marker question. Definitely this particular question will involve a level 3 response. So what do we need to write? We need to write a relevant points in which we are going to give reasons all right that why you know the tree are damaged and we will give them in detail and logically linked form to you know form a clear account of the question that is being asked to get the six marks so why would damaging root kill that particular tree so first of all root you know with the root what does what are the things that the plant does we need to think of that so uh, root the root is used for absorbing water and mineral ions right so less absorption of water will occur that means less lower rate of photosynthesis will take place so less glucose will be produced and less glucose will be available for respiration you can also choose to write other consequences of having less glucose being produced which is less cellulose are produced so fewer cell walls are made we can also say fewer amino acids are produced to make fewer proteins since less cell wall is produced we can also say the cell loses turgidity we can also say you know the cell loses turgidity because of less water availability here we can see we have covered a total of five to you know five to six points. However, only writing this this single point with the less absorption of water and then completing answer will not give us the full mark for getting a level six mark answer. Uh, sorry, level three and six mark answer. We need to write for other points like less absorption of mineral ions, which means fewer nitrates, so fewer proteins are made for growth. We can say fewer magnesium, so less chlorophyll are produced. 
as a as a result lower rate of photosynthesis because this particular uh, you know uh, the larva of the hornet moth damages damages the roots of the trees all right it also ends up damaging the phloem so less sugars are transported to the root cells so less amount of sugar available for respiration now relating to the damage of the xylem we can say less water is transported fewer nitrates reach the cells fewer proteins are made you know this is like a you know this is like a uh, a cyclic point so we we need to be careful we do not write the same point again and again so damage to xylem and finally we can say damage to root means less anchorage for the plant so the plant can easily get uprooted by wind the larva of the hornet moth form when fertilized eggs divide by mitosis describe how mitosis produces two genetically identical cells during mitosis genetic material such as chromosomes are doubled they're duplicated so the replicated chromosomes they are pulled apart and the cytoplasms then divide into two cells the set of chromosomes in each cells are identical to one another, which is why it produces identical cells. The cells which are first formed from fertilized eggs of the hornet moth are stem cells. Name the process by which these stem cells then form specialized cells. The process of turning a stem cell into specialized cell is known as differentiation. Water and carbon dioxide are exchanged between leaves and the atmosphere through pores called stomata. Name the cells that control the opening and closing of the stomata. The opening and closing of the stomata is generally controlled by the guard cells in the upper or lower epidermis, mostly in the lower epidermis. Guard cells, when they become turgid, all right, when they become turgid, they open the stomata. And when the guard cells become flaccid, they have unevenly distributed cell wall, which, which closes them, which shuts them down. The opening is called stoma, which is singular, and the plural is known as stomata. Water moves through a plant in the transpiration stream. Describe two differences between the transpiration stream and translocation. So the transpiration stream involves a xylem and translocation involves phloem. And in the second point, we can write transpiration stream transports water and mineral ions that are resolved in it and translocation transport dissolved sugars. As an added point, we can write transpiration stream moves substances upwards, whereas translocation moves substances upwards and downwards in all directions. Which environmental conditions would cause the rate of transpiration to be greatest in a plant? Now, if the temperature is cold, then rate of transpiration will be low because water molecules will have lower kinetic energy. So warm, will be the first requirement high humidity meaning that the uh, you know atmosphere contains a lot of moisture already so new moistures will take will have to have higher gradient you know uh, in order um, there will be you know there must be a gradient between the atmosphere and between the atmosphere and the uh, the air spaces in the uh, leaves all right for the humidity if there is high humidity already present outside then water vapor will not move out through the stomata with low humidity the water vapor will easily move out so it will be it will we will need it warm and low humidity which will give the greatest rate of transpiration figure 7 shows information about the mean width of the stomata in a plant mean width of stomata in arbitrary units from the midnight midday to midnight again time of the day we can see at the midnight uh, mean uh, rate of transpiration is the lowest the mean width of arbitrary uh, stomata in arbitrary unit are the lowest okay the changes in the mean width of stomata is no in normal conditions are an advantage to the plant explain how so in normal conditions we can see stomatas are closed at midnights all right so what do we get out of that particular information stomatas are almost closed at midnight because there is no light that is there present for photosynthesis so closing the stomata prevents water loss stomata open widest at the midday you can see it is the widest open at the midday so what will that do basically stomata since it is open widest at the midday as maximum light density is available for photosynthesis so maximum absorption of carbon dioxide is needed so the stomatas are wide open the stomatas open wide to take in more carbon dioxide for photosynthesis
The changes in the mean width of stomata in low atmospheric carbon dioxide are different from the changes in normal condition. Explain how the difference helps the plant to survive in low atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. The stomatas are open wider and for longer. Stomatas, we can see they are open at low atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration as you can see they are open more wider and they are open for longer even at mid midnight they are open as you can see so why is that it's because the stomatas you know if they are open it allows the plant to take in more and more carbon dioxide which is needed for photosynthesis table 6 shows information about five different organisms so we can see organism a to e Surface area in meter square, volume in meter cube, and surface area to volume ratio, we can see. All right. We have to calculate the value in X, in a value of X in table 6. We have to give the answer nearest to whole number. We are given the volume. This is the volume. Uh, so, uh, because we have to do surface area is to volume ratio. So, SA here in meter square given 9.96 times 10 to the power of minus 3 ratio. 1.35 into 10 to the power of minus 4 which is the volume so if we were to do that then we will divide it so that is 73.77 which is equivalent to 74 what is the relationship between the size of an organism and its surface area to volume ratio so we can say generally all right it is always going to be correct so just you can memorize it as well as the size increases surface area to volume ratio decreases Organism B exchanges gases with the environment directly through its skin. Organism D exchanges gases with the environment using its respiratory system. Explain why organism D requires a respiratory system but organism B does not require a resp respiratory. So basically any organism that does not require a respiratory system that can take the oxygen directly through its skin has a very large surface area compared to its volume ratio. Whereas the Organism D requires a gas exchange surface because it has to provide another surface other than its skin to provide the large surface area to volume ratio. So we will say organism D has a smaller surface area to volume ratio than B as a result. Diffusion alone. So the diffusion distance is too large to meet the demands of the cells in organism D. Table 6 is repeated below. You can see the ratios back again. Table 7 shows information about organism D and E. Metabolic rate in arbitrary units in D is 890 and E is 75. Organism D and E both keep a constant body temperature. That means they are warm-blooded. Explain why the metabolic rate of organism D is greater than the metabolic rate of organism E. So in comparison with both of them, what we can deduce is that since a particular organism has a higher metabolic rate, higher metabolic rate is associated with large surface area compared to volume ratio. So, the organism, since it is warm blooded, is going to lose heat more quickly per unit time, alright, or per unit volume than organism E. As a result, D requires greater rate of respiration, and as the respiration is large part of the metabolism, so D needs to generate more heat to keep itself warm, and thereby D has a very high rate of metabolism. Organism D and organism E both have alveoli in the lungs and villi in the small intestine. Figure 8 shows some alveoli and some villi. So we can see the alveoli and we can see how it is surrounded by blood vessels. And then we can see villi and we can see how it is surrounded by blood vessels for you know efficient exchange of nutrients. Describe how the alveoli and the villi are adapted to increase absorption. Since this is a 4 marker but it requires uh you know uh you know a level two answer where we have to write scientifically relevant fact and events or processes we will need to identify and give a detail to form an accurate account of how the alveoli and villi are adapted to increase absorption so i'm going to give you some points those that are for individual and i'm going to give you other points those that are for both of them applicable to both of them so first of all we'll start with the one that is applicable to both of them in within the, within the diagram we can already see that both of them provides a large surface area which is to maximize diffusion both of them have thin walls that are only one cell thick to reduce diffusion distance if you look into the diagram both of them have only one cell thick all right thin walls
Both alveoli and villi have close proximity to the blood supply, which reduces diffusion distance for the nutrients or the uh, oxygen or carbon dioxide for diffuse, diffusion in and diffusion out. Both of the structures have good blood supply and have a capillary network close to it to maintain concentration gradient. Villi have microvilli which further increases the surface area and the cells of the villi also contain many mitochondria which aids for active transport of substances those that are higher in concentration within the cell but lower in concentration within the small intestine. Human immunodeficiency virus HIV is a pathogen. Give one way HIV can spread from one person to another. HIV can spread from one person to another by you know forms of direct contact. What are the forms of direct contact? Mainly sexual intercourse or exchange of body fluids. Table it shows information about new cases of HIV diagnosed in the UK. From the year 2010 to 2018, the number of new HIV cases in women dropped from 376. Uh, initially, it increased, then it decreased to 240. The number of new HIV cases in men went from 2,200 uh, to uh, 20, 2,266 to 1,288. Initially, we can see there was an increase and then it decreased. Describe the trend shown in table 8 between 2010 and 2000. So we can say the number of cases in women decreased. In the beginning, it decreases, then increases again, and then decreases back again. The number of cases in men increases and then decreases. So just one reason for the change in the number of new HIV cases between 2014 and 2018. Since the question says that we have to suggest means we have to think of a creative answer. So why did the number of HIV cases decrease from 2014 to 2018? One of the reasons could be that, you know, better education into prevention of the spread of HIV. So people were more aware of it. Or we can say condoms were more widely available and, you know, they were cheaper. So it was since it was widely available, all right, and it was cheaper. So people, uh, you know, readily got it and used it. There are new or better drugs to prevent the HIV infection from spreading. And there is a better form of testing. So people with HIV got easily identified and they could isolate themselves. So all of these are valid points. You just need to write one of them. However, I'm going to give you all of them. You just need to write one of them and choose which one you want to write since this particular question repeats in a similar manner, all right? So it will always have the same answer. Calculate the ratio of the new cases in of HIV in women to new cases of HIV in men in 2018. Give your answer to three significant figures. So women ratio with men and we're doing it for 2018. 242, 1288. So we'll have to divide 242 with 1288. This gives us 0 0.1878, which is equivalent to 0 0.188 in three significant figures. So the answer comes 0 0.188 ratio 1. In the UK population, the total number of women is greater than the total number of men. The data in Table 8 is used to compare the proportion of new cases of HIV in the population for men and women. Such is how the data could be presented differently so that more valid comparisons can be made. If the calculation is done as a percentage, then it gives a better you know, uh, understanding of that particular data and makes a valid comparison. Or if the information is given uh, by the numbers per 100,000, then it also gives a better uh, comparison, valid comparison. So both of these can be used uh, nicely. So either or you can write any one of them. Scientists have been working to produce a vaccine for the HIV for many years. Explain how a vaccine for HIV could work to prevent a person from developing HIV infection. So generally, we have to understand how a vaccine works. HIV virus is no different. So what we have to give the particular person is that we have to give them inactive HIV virus into, we can, you know, inject that inactive HIV virus directly into the bloodstream or the muscle. Generally, let's put it in the body. Then white blood cells will produce antibodies against that inactive virus. So later on, if the person is infected with HIV, then the specific antibodies are produced more rapidly and quickly. And those antibodies will then, you know, destroy the active HIV virus that has entered the person's body. A person with 
late stage HIV infection has AIDS. Scientists have produced monoclonal antibodies for HIV. The monoclonal antibodies can prevent a person infected with HIV developing AIDS. Describe how the monoclonal antibodies for HIV can be produced. So generally, the production of monoclonal antibodies is always similar. The first idea will be that we will you know, inject the HIV antigen into a mouse. Then we will collect the mouse lymphocytes that make specific antibody or HIV. Then we will combine the lymphocyte with a tumor cell with a cancer cells specifically. Do not mention tumor cells because sometimes the tumor cells are rejected. Okay, the lymphocytes will then be combined with cancer cells to produce hybridoma cells. The hybridoma cells can be cloned to create many many hybridoma cells but they are still able to produce antibody. Figure 9 shows how HIV enters a human cell. So we can see HIV antigen. HIV antigen binding site in the human cell and then once it binds with it the genetic HIV genetic material that can go inside that white blood cell or the lymphocyte suggest how the monoclonal antibodies for HIV helps prevent person infected with HIV developing AIDS so the monoclonal antibody is complementary to specific shape of HIV antigen so what the monoclonal antibody will do it will it will bind with the HIV antigen beforehand this is the maps so the maps will bind with it once the maps bind with it the HIV uh, virus will not be able to attach this process will not be able to occur it will not be able to attach because it is already detected as a foreign protein all right by the maps and then this process of you know injecting the genetic material into the lymphocyte will not occur so we are going to write down the answer in this way monoclonal antibody is complementary to hiv antigen monoclonal antibodies attach to all the hiv antigens so hiv cannot bind to human so hiv genetic material cannot enter human cell that's the end of this particular question paper thank you for watching the video guys we will try to upload question paper like this regularly so you know keep an eye for the question papers all right and uh, i will try to put them in a playlist as you know as early as possible once that particular playlist is completed so guys you know uh, so subscribe to the channel and support the channel and let the channel grow write in the comments that what kind of question paper videos that you want next and definitely we will try to put them in a list all right where we are gonna solve it and get you know edited we'll edit the video and and then we'll upload it the main problem here we find out is that you know the editing takes a pretty long period of time and our editors are busy they, they try you know they try uh, and uh, you know uh, just keep supporting the channel so that we can get that appreciation to work harder as for as much as possible all right to get to you that videos all right which you like most uh thank you so much all right and um best of luck for your exam thank you for watching the video see you in the next exam guys Bye bye